thanks again, everyone, for coming uh, and joining us today um, for our for another in our series of expert webinars, uh, expert connections, I should say. Um, so we've got a great uh, presentation lineup today from a great presenter. Um, but I thought I might start with uh, acknowledging um, uh, the country that we're meeting on today. So we respectfully acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the land and water on which all Australians rely. We pay our respects to Wurundjeri, Bunurong and Wadawurrung, their elders past, present and future as traditional owners and the custodians of the land and water on which we rely and operate. Uh, so thank you for everyone that's uh, come and uh, joined us today. Um, we have Katie Howard from the Arthur Ryle Institute, uh, who's going to be talking to us about freshwater turtles and uh, conservation efforts. So Katie works for the Arthur Ryle Institute in um, the Environmental Research Department uh, for the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, and has over 15 years experience working with freshwater and marine turtles, both in Australia and internationally. The focus of much of Katie's recent work relates to assessing the response of turtles to drought and flood, Working at the Barma Milawa Icon State, uh, Icon Site, sorry, her work focuses on identifying threats to turtles and management practices that may assist population recovery. So, thank you very much for joining us today, Katie, and um, I'll hand it straight over to you to start your presentation. Thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm giving this talk from Wurundjeri Country, so I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I'd also like to pay um, special, um, a special shout out to Yorta Yorta Nation Aboriginal Corporation. They've been great supporters of turtle conservation and most of our work is done on their lands. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge them um, and their elders past, present and emerging as well. So yeah, today I'm just going to um, have a chat about turtles and if uh, I was on the right screen, that would work. Great. Um, so an overview, we're just going to go through a general meet and greet, introduce you to the three turtle species that you can find in Victoria. And I'll go through some of the threats to turtles, how we monitor the populations and survey them um, to track these threats. And then I'm just going to finish up with some um, examples of citizen science and how you can get involved if you're interested in turtles and turtle conservation. So there are three species of turtles that are native to Victoria. There are two long neck species, which are, you can see on the page here. So the top one is your broad shell turtle. It's a much larger species, um, the largest that we have in Victoria. And it's quite rare. It only really comes out to nest. So you're unlikely to see it because it doesn't bask either. And then the one at the bottom is your eastern long neck turtle. Um, and this is the one you're most going, you're going to encounter um, the most. It's um, the more terrestrial species. So you do find them on land walking around quite a bit. Um, and then your third species is your Murray River turtle, which is your short neck species. And that's the only short neck species that we have down here. We do sometimes get some invasive species, such as the red-eared slider, which is a a short neck species. Um, they look very different though. They have bright red um, stripe uh, down the side of their head and also more yellow stripes as well. So the turtle life cycle, I'm just going to go through very quickly because each stage of the life cycle has different threats associated with it. Obviously we'd start with the nesting stage. So the, uh, you have your nests that are buried on land. And there are quite a few specific threats uh, associated with this stage in that uh, you have predators that might come and raid and dig up the, the eggs and eat them. You have native predators, which can include ravens and um, water rats, even echidnas, I think, <laughs> being known to dig them up. And then you have non-native species such as the red fox, which is very prolific and does dig up a lot of, um, a lot of turtle nests. So it's quite a very cool stage as well in that um, the eggs like to hatch synchronously. And what that means is that they like to hatch around the same time. So they all can um, emerge from the nest together and help to dig their way out of the nest as a collective. It makes it a lot easier. And when they hatch, obviously you have your juveniles. It's a bit hard to see scale here. So 
This is a photo um, just to show you how big they are when they come out of the nest. Very tiny. And what they have is they have what's called an egg tooth on the edge of their nose, which is this really sharp protrusion that helps them um, cut their way out of the egg and falls off later on. And when you're a juvenile turtle, um, obviously the first thing you need to do is make it to the water. And they're quite small. So this is a bit of like a snack size treat for fish, eels, even yet large yabbies would eat them, um, water birds such as herons. So it is a bit of a tricky life stage uh, and a lot of the juveniles don't make it to adulthood. Um, but those that do, obviously quite lucky. And it may take many years for a turtle to reach adulthood, which is uh, sexual maturity. So where they can breed and then lay eggs again um, and you know fulfill that life cycle. So species such as the Eastern long neck turtle, that's the smallest turtle that we have in Victoria, may take five to seven years to reach sexual maturity. But your really large turtles, like your broadshell turtle, could take 10 to 12 years. So, so this first phase does take quite a long time. And then obviously your turtles will breed and you have your female that comes out and nests on land. And obviously doing that does um, increase the risk that the turtle um, might encounter foxes uh, or might cross roads and be hit by cars. So that is obviously any time in which a turtle leaves the water um, to come out and nest, uh, it increases its chances um, of uh, coming across foul play, shall we say, survivorship. So nesting and hatching, if you're wanting to see a turtle when it's out nesting, it, it, it does happen at very particular times of the year. So your Eastern long neck turtle and your Murray River turtle, they'll come out somewhere between September to November. And typically after big rain events, so the rain helps to soften the soil, makes it easier for the turtles to dig their nest and lay the eggs. So that is really a great time um, to be looking for them if you're around wetlands and that kind of thing, and you know that there's turtles in the area. These guys um, also nest quite close to the wetlands. So typically within about 30 metres of the water, and they like to nest in preferred spots. So usually open, open canopy so that there's sunlight. Um, and so you often find clusters of nests together. They're not very spread out. And in terms of the hatchlings, they then emerge January to February. Um, and you can see here, they do look very different. So the one on the left here is your Eastern long neck turtle. They have these real distinctive black bands on them, but when, they're, when they first come out, they also have this really beautiful deep orange color on the underside, which is very pretty. Now your third species, the broadshell turtle, which is the biggest long neck species. That is a little bit different in that it comes out um, in autumn. So anywhere from March and April, mostly in April and the start of May. These guys have a little bit of a different nesting strategy. So they're coming out before winter and spring where you can get um, flow, higher rainfall events and flows and flooding. So they tend to nest a bit higher up and also further away from the wetlands. Um, sometimes they nest up to 300 metres away, which is quite a long way for a little juvenile turtle to make its way back after it's hatched, which um, seems a little bit harsh, but um, it is a great strategy. They're quite solitary nesters, so it is much harder to find their nests typically. And their juveniles, their hatchlings, it's a little bit trickier to say when they're going to emerge. So broad-shelled turtles are really interesting in that the, um, the hatchlings will overwinter in the nest and they can stay in the nest anywhere from three, 200 to 600 days. So if conditions aren't right, they will stay in the nest and they might emerge the next spring. So it's, it's quite a great um, adaption um, to the environment conditions. Um, so you might see them coming out in October, but then again, they might be they might be much later down in January and February as well. So a bit trickier to come across those guys when they're emerging. 
So I'm just going to go through each of the three species um, and their habits, introduce you to them a little bit more. So your eastern long neck turtle, which is the smallest one, you see it has these beautiful black markings on the underside of its shell. So the most distinguishing feature about this turtle. And they also can range in colour from orange to like a pale cream. These are the ones that you're going to encounter the most. So they are very terrestrial. They like to move across land from wetlands, in between wetlands. So they'll have multiple wetlands within their home range. So these are the ones that you often find crossing roads as well. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> The one that you are likely to encounter the most is also the one that smells the worst. So people have sometimes um, picked up these turtles to move them off the road, which is great, and then had the idea, oh, I'm going to put it in my car and drive it to the wetland. Not so great because your car is going to smell straight away. They have a very pungent um, musk gland under, uh, underneath their shell where their shoulder or arm connects in. Um, and it is extremely strong. Um, the other two species don't smell though, so I don't want this one to give everybody a bad name. In terms of uh, diet, they like to eat crustaceans and decapods, so little water bugs and shrimps. And they also do eat um, carrion, so dead animals, which would mostly be fish. Uh, you, one of your other species, the Murray River turtle, so this is the short neck species. These are the ones that you're most likely to see basking. So your eastern long neck turtle are the ones you're most likely to see walking across land. And then your Murray River turtles are the ones that are most likely basking. And they might do this just by floating at the top of the water or they might come out onto logs like you can see here. They are um, largely vegetarian and they do have quite a beak on them, which is extremely sharp they have quite a nasty bite so these guys um, you need to be very careful with um, if you're say moving them over across the road if you see them crossing a road obviously anytime you see a turtle um, always best to leave it don't handle them if they're crossing a road and they're in danger then obviously that's it's a great thing to be able to move them it's safe to do so um, the other distinguishing um, factor with this one is uh, the yellow stripe. So that's it's quite an easy way to see whether it's um, a Murray River turtle or not if they're further away because it has that very obvious yellow stripe down their cheek there. And last but not least is my favourite, even though you're not meant to have favourites, um, the broadshell turtle. So if you excuse the very bad field hair, in this picture, I've just put it up to show you just the size that they can get to. This is not quite the largest one we've captured, but it's close to it. So they can get up to seven kilos and their length of their shell can be nearly half a metre. So I think the largest one is um, that we've come across is 43 centimetres, which is quite considerable. They are ambush predators, so it's very cool. They'll sit on the bottom of the water and they'll have their neck retracted in. And when something goes past that is small enough to fit within their mouth, they'll shoot their neck out and grab, grab their prey and swallow it. Um, they are extremely shy though. So you won't see them basking. You won't see them moving about on land unless they've just come out to nest. So certainly the ones that you're least likely to encounter. So I've just put these, um, I've just put them side by side here so that you can see some of the different characteristics if you see the turtles out and about. Um, the Murray River turtle, like I said, the short neck and you have this yellow colouring here. It's quite distinctive from the other two species. With your long neck species, you can see here the broad shell turtle, it can't actually retract its neck fully into its shell. While your eastern long neck turtle, it does, it really, really, really tightly pulls in all its limbs and its neck. Um, this is one of uh, the very easy ways to tell them apart. And the eastern long neck turtle obviously has these really great bands, black bands, which is a distinguishing feature too. Um, and just as a little added bonus, you, you might be able to see here, you've got your adult broadshell turtle. And then on the top there, this is maybe a three year old just to show you the size difference between an adult and a juvenile, you get to um, 
quite considerable size. So there are quite a few threats to turtles. Um, there have been some significant declines over recent years. And this includes just to the population in general and also declines in the number of um, juvenile or baby turtles that we're seeing entering the populations. So there are a lot of threats and risks out there to turtles. An obvious one obviously is um, if you're there crossing the road during nesting season or if a wetland fills and they're trying to get to wetlands, um, that is an issue. Another major issue is obviously water. Turtles are dependent on water. And if you have um, long drought events such as the millennium drought, this is gonna have quite a negative effect on the population, either through um, direct mortality or just that the turtles will lose a lot of condition because there's less habitat and then there's more competition for resources. So you may have like a reduction in breeding and nesting because of this as well. And this can sometimes be compounded as well by water regulation. So most of our waterways are regulated and often we release more water in summer and hold back water in winter. So we can have a bit of a reversal there in the natural flow. Uh, which can um, have some negative effects too. One of the biggest threats is the introduced red fox. It has, it will eat both um, adults, juveniles and nests. So it covers all life cycle stages really. Um, any adults that are out moving on land either to nest or to get to other water bodies are at risk. And you can see here, you've got um, part of the shell has been gnawed off by a fox. And then the other thing that they're um, particularly good at is locating turtle nests and digging them up. So you can see the shell fragments here in front of the nest. And um, some of our experiments have shown that they can dig up to 100% of nests up in some regions. So yeah, it's, it's quite a significant threat and there's a lot of research going on in this space to try um, to try uh, change this and have some impact on nest survivorship. Now, this nest um, shows you like, as well what it looks like when a nest is raided and the eggs are out. It is quite tricky to see a nest if it hasn't been raided, um, but I will show you some photos later from Hansi's project um, that might help you locate some in your area if they haven't been. So the way that we, um, track these threats through time and see how they influence the turtle populations is by monitoring and surveying. And the two types of nets that we use this uh, use to do this mostly are cathedral nets, which you can see on the left and fike nets on the right. So this is my colleague Louise looking super duper happy with a cathedral net. And um, how the cathedral nets work is that the turtle will enter through the bottom through a funnel and what it's trying to get to is this delicious beef liver that we've put in to attract them. And then they'll go up for air through this last funnel. And then they're held in this top compartment up in here. And Louise isn't particularly happy as well because right down here is a broadshell turtle in our net, which is always exciting. The other type of net we use is the fike net. So this is more in shallow water. And what we have is we have a wing that extends out from the entrance of the net. And that just, um, it sits within the water column. So if a turtle is coming along, it'll hit the wing and it has to go either left or right. It increases our chances of catching them essentially. And we do attract them to the area again by using some um, bait and they go through a series of funnels. So they're held in the net until we come collect them the next morning. Um, obviously, we have permits and go through um, ethics uh, procedures in order to use these nets. So I feel like though these photos are probably painting a really nice rainbows lollipops picture of um, turtle research. It's obviously not always like this. It's not always sunny with glorious uh, sunsets. It's often raining and muddy and awful and the wetlands are not always that nice. They're often quite horrible, <laughs> but um, it's still fun nonetheless. So when we uh, catch our turtles, we uh, take some measurements. So we weigh them, we'll measure their length and their width. 
And this kind of information helps us to um, calculate turtle condition, you know, how much fat they might have, um, whether they're healthy or not. And then we also mark the shell. This is we do what, do what we call a notch on the shell. And this means that we can individually identify every turtle that we've um, captured. And this allows us to look at things like their changing condition through time, uh, whether they might use different habitats at different periods, you can get a lot of great information from that in long-term studies. One of the other cool things we do as well is we track the turtle movements. And this really um, feeds into that issue that we have with water management and just understanding where turtles might go and when, uh, depending on what, what's happening with water releases. So what we've got here on the top left, we've got a Murray River turtle and it's got a VHF tag on it. A VHF tag is essentially a radio tag. It sends out a signal over a certain uh, wavelength, which we can pick up using an antenna and a receiver, and then we can track the turtle, see where it goes. The one down on the left is a slightly more complicated one. This is also um, a VHF radio tag, but it has a GPS unit attached to it. So we can put this on the turtle for many months and it will record its locations in the GPS unit. And then we can track it using the antenna, find out where it is and then download the data. Um, and something a little bit different on the, on the right here, again is a Murray River turtle, and this has an acoustic tag on it. So you may be more familiar with acoustic technology with fish, they use it a lot to track fish movements. It's also a great tool for tracking turtles. How it works is that, um, the tag emits a series of pings. And when it's underwater, if it passes a receiver, the receiver will detect those pings and record that the turtle has been there near that receiver. You have lots of receivers all through the forest. So when the turtle moves around, it'll get detected by them. And then you can see where the turtles have gone, which is great. Sometimes um, the turtles move very long distances. So we might have to go up in planes to locate where they are. We have had a Murray River turtle move 100 kilometers. So they do get around and sometimes they can be difficult to track down once you let them go. I've just got a little short video here of a um, Eastern long neck turtle. So this is one that we um, attached a GPS and radio tag to, tracked its movements for a few months. And I know that it seemed quite slow, which is everybody thinks turtles are slow, but I must also say that Murray River turtles are definitely not. If you have them on land and you release them, they are extremely quick. So not all turtles are slow. If you are interested in some of the field work that we do, we do have a YouTube video up called Turtle Trappin. Um, it is a 360 video, so you can move around and you can see um, a whole 360 view of the forest or the wetland where we are, and you can watch us processing turtles as well. So um, I think there'll be a link to that at some point put up too, but you should be able to find it easy on the DELP website. If you're interested, come along and see what we do. So... Um, one of the main parts of the talk was to discuss citizen science and ways in which people might be able to get involved in um, turtle conservation if they're interested. And there's, I'm going to outline two different ways in which you can do that. One which is uh, more of an indirect um, involvement and one which is direct volunteering on projects. So I don't know how many people have heard of TurtleSat before, but it's an excellent platform for um, mapping your observations and getting involved in conservation. So at the moment, it's got just over 9,000 records on there. It is something that you can download to your phone 
or you can just directly log in um, over the internet on your computer. So it's very user friendly. How it works is that you, uh, you register first and then you can map your observations. And this is quite easy. If you're doing it on your phone, it can use your phone's GPS. You, you don't even have to worry about where exactly you are. Uh, but if you're doing it on your computer as well, it will bring up a map and you can select the location where you found um, either the turtle or the nest. And it has really great information on it um, for each of the three species um, and how you can tell them apart. And if you are unsure, you can also upload photos that can help in identification too. It's a really easy to use platform. And the type of things that you can put down as observations are turtle nests, either raided or um, intact nests, obviously live turtles, uh, which are most likely encountered when crossing roads, but also just general observations that you might see at your local wetlands. And the other one is um, dead turtles. So we have here um, a turtle shell. This section is called the plastron. That's the underneath of the turtle shell. So it sits on the underside here. And this section, the top part is called the carapace. So it's the domed section. And they're connected by what's called the bridge. So when you find a dead turtle shell, you may find it whole, but most of the time you'll find it like this where it's being broken up and um, the section that's most likely to last the longest is your underside, the plastron. Just because it's flat, it tends not to break down as quickly. If you do find a dead turtle shell, there is a way of identifying it. So I have your three turtles here. And these images are from COGA, which is um, the uh, Reptiles and Frogs of Australia book, which is excellent. If you want more information, um, I recommend having a look. So this is your underside or your plastron of each turtle. And these, um, these are what we call scoots or which you might think of as scales. And you, you have them on the top of the shell obviously as well. And the one that we're interested in here are the ones highlighted in yellow. This is called the Intergula scoot, which is don't need to remember it at all. Um, but as you can see, the placement is extremely different on each plastron. So this is a really excellent tool of working out um, what species the turtle was, um, even though it has, um, even though it's deceased. So you may River turtle, it's more like a square shape. As you can see, it, um, it comes right to the edge of the plastron. Your broad shell turtle, it's just touching, but it's more of a, an oblong oval shape while well, your eastern long neck turtle is set well back from the edge of the plastron and it has this real definitive diamond shape. So if I was to bring up the photo before that we were looking at, you can see here, this is the outline of your scoot or your scale. It's in a definitive diamond shape and it's well set back from the edge of the plastron. So this turtle was an eastern long neck turtle. Um, and yeah, like I said, you can access this kind of information through books like Cogga, or we may be able to um, make some cheat sheets with Melbourne Water if people are interested as well. So this kind of mapping, it is really great. <clears throat> it doesn't just sit there and do nothing. It, um, it has been used. Uh, one example of that is this great study by Claudia Santori that was looking at road mortality. Um, but there's lots of other um, ways in which the data can be used as well. And this is just showing you how many records we have in Eastern Australia. And it's great. We have tons through New South Wales and Victoria, which is excellent. Now, the second way that you can get involved is obviously through direct volunteering. And there's lots of opportunities for people to do that. Um, I'm just gonna highlight one project um, in this talk, which is the um, Dangian Citizen Science Turtle Project. So this is uh, down in the Mornington Peninsula at the Devil Bend Reservoir. Um, and it is run entirely um, by volunteers and managed by volunteer. And Hansi, which is this fellow right here, he's an absolute legend and he runs this program and all the volunteers and does such an amazing job. And I'm just gonna go through um, some of the work that they do 
what the volunteers are involved in and the you know what the, the changes that they've done to the site it's um it's really quite remarkable so the whole program as i said is just because of volunteers and support that they have primarily from melbourne water and parks victoria and they also have some linkages with the local school ambassador program as well which hansi is involved in doing too and um they also have local indigenous organization bonjawara and I think everything is pretty much coordinated under the umbrella of Parks Vic volunteers. So it's a really excellent program. And the type of activities that they do, um, obviously surveying and mapping for turtle nests is gonna be one of the most uh, important and easy things um, to accomplish. So it's quite amazing because Hansi and his group of volunteers during the nesting season go out two times a week uh, obviously the number of volunteers they have each time is, is fluctuates and they have managed to map the entire reserve and locate where turtles are nesting. Um, as I said earlier, they do have preferred nesting um, areas. So this is really great because it helps you to focus any nest protection work activities you might do by doing um, a complete survey like this and working out where they like to nest. So you've got um, two rated nests up the top here and then down the bottom, this is showing you what an unrated nest looks like. Um, they can be quite tricky sometimes to locate. So right here you have what's called the nest plug. So when the females laid the eggs, they release water and they also they stamp down the mud to create a bit of a plug over the nest. So sometimes that is quite obvious like it is here and other times not so obvious. And they do um, cover it with leaf litter and all sorts of stuff. So it can be quite tricky to find. So um, they've done, they have mapped nests across two seasons now and they have found that the turtles are clustering in terms of their nesting in the same areas, which is not surprising. And it's been great because Doing that has then meant you could, they focus their efforts on nest protection. So what we're seeing here is um, some steel mesh that's put down to protect the nests against foxes. So they have um, quite an issue with fox predation like most areas in Victoria. And they've managed to uh, protect 53 nests in the first season. And this is the outcome where you get these gorgeous little um, hatchlings come out. This is an Eastern long neck turtle hatchling so it's great also to see, see the benefits of what you're doing when you get some hatchlings like that. You can release them, it's super special. The program though, um, it's really value adding in a lot of other ways as well. So they have figured out that um, when this is full of water, turtles like to nest along the sides of the culverts. And when you mow, the mower strips off the surface layers of the soil and could potentially disturb the nest. So they've put in place these no mow go no mow zones. <laughs> it's a bit tricky to say quickly. Um, through sections of the reserve where they found clusters of nests, which is really great, helps to protect them. And then the other thing they've done is worked out in certain areas where they have um, clusters of nests starting to get some vegetation management issues and weed encroachment. And so um, they're also doing some vegetation management around that as well, which is really great. They also have some um, collaborations with local land care groups in terms of setting up fox baiting on private land and also involved in training a sniffer dog to find turtle nests. So this is kind of like a, just such an excellent project because it um, it really addresses lots of issues to do with turtle conservation all in one go and it's very impressive. So um, in terms of volunteering or getting involved, if you are, there are multiple different ways, like I said, you can do it um, through using something like the Turtle Sat app where you just, uh, your your observations, putting your observations in and logging them and they can be used for management, such as looking at hotspots of road mortality and that kind of thing. You can do direct involvement uh, through volunteering. So I highlighted the Dangian Turtle Project today. Uh, you can contact them at this email address. 
but there are also a lot of others out there. So one example is Winton Wetlands and you have the Friends of Winton Wetlands group and they have a great turtle conservation program there as well. So what I would recommend if you're looking to volunteer that you uh, look up friends groups in your area. If you have a particular wetland that's of interest, um, uh, look that up and see whether anyone's doing any work. And I would also like to say, don't underestimate how important it is just doing small acts like moving a turtle off the road if it's safe to do so. That turtle might only be 10 years old and it might live for another 50 years. So those kind of acts um, are really also great for turtle conservation too. Hopefully that's given you just a brief overview of Victorian turtles. Um, I hope you all had a turtly good time. Bad pun, but I couldn't help myself. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Katie. That was absolutely brilliant. Really, really interesting. Um, so thank you for that. We've got a few questions coming through. Uh, first one is, does turtle stat Will turtle sat feed into ALA? Yes, I believe there are linkages between the two, yes. Could you just clarify what ALA is? Oh, Atlas of Living Australia, sorry. Um, so, um, so in Victoria, for example, we have the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. So you can put records of animals and plants and that on there. And so often um, other apps like Turtle Sat app will feed into these or you have linkages between them so that um, you have everything is kind of going into a, it, the databases for each state, if that makes sense. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so Andrew is saying that he has a dam in Lower Plenty with several turtles and has a major rabbit problem. Um, and so he's got a rabbit proof fence around the property. However, migrating turtles can't get through it. Have you any experience with turtle gates? Um, and they've said they've used weighted wombat gates in rabbit fences. So hopefully they can get through without damaging the fence. Would a sim similar concept work for turtles? I, <clears throat> I'm guessing that the species you have is probably an Eastern long neck turtle. Um, that's going to be a bit tricky because I feel like whatever can let through a turtle will let through a rabbit. I, I'm, I don't know that there's an easy way around it. I think it's excellent you have a rabbit proof fence, but yes, I can see that it is creating issues as well for the turtles to migrate between um, dams. Oh, um, I haven't heard of anything that can do that. I'm sorry. Uh, next question, do goannas dig up nests? Yes, yes, they certainly do. And especially in the top end, very well known for doing that. Um, so where we've done our nest studies along the Murray, um, they don't seem to do that so much. I'm not quite sure why, but certainly in the top end, very, yeah, very, very good at locating and digging them up. Um, they have... Um... Another question here, Eastern long neck that is 30 to 32 years old and often makes a nest in the leaves. Would she still be able to breed at that age? Yeah, so turtles are fantastic in the sense that um, they don't really have a cutoff breeding period like us humans do. They would just continue breeding and um, the older and the larger the turtle it gets, um, often that means it can lay more eggs as well. So, but they'll just keep on breeding, yep, every year. And could you give a bit more detail about how seasonal flow reversal in regulated rivers affects turtles? Sure, so, <clears throat> You have some compounding factors, I suppose, with the flow side of things in that um, if you have a drought, for example, you may have um, withholding of water. If you might have a natural rain event um, because they'll need that water to fill the dams or for irrigation purposes. So you may have drying um, creek lines or wetlands that would typically receive water that don't. So that, um, that is an issue, obviously, because without the water, you'd, 
you don't have the turtles. Um, and so you can get a lot of um, competition and overcrowding in those kind of areas where water is receding. And I suppose the other issue as well is that you have this reversal um, where you have higher flows in summer and lower flows in winter. It's not necessarily always an issue, but it would be, for example, if you had an overbank flow in the nesting season. So Eastern longneck turtles and Murray River turtles will come out and nest. And in like um, September, October, if you had a large flow event that overbanked in November, then you would inundate the nests and kill the eggs. So that also is an issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a uh, attendee that came in a bit late is just asking when is turtle nesting season in Victoria? And they've seen Eastern Longneck on Corroy Creek lately. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So right now is, is good for turtle nesting. So your Eastern Longneck turtle and your Murray River turtle um, will nest um, September, October, uh, sometimes November as well. Um, so after rains right now is a great time to see those two species. If you're up uh, northern Victoria near the Murray Way, broadshell turtles come out and nest more in um, April, May. Cool, thank you. And what are the emerging strat stats and trends for the population numbers for the three species that you've mentioned? So broadshell turtles... Um, relatively stable at the moment. The two species that are of concern in terms of declines is your Eastern Longneck Turtle and your Murray River Turtle. And I really should have predicted this question and brushed up on my stats beforehand. <laughs> but there have been some, um, so Bruce Chessman, for example, did a great study looking at populations, um, comparing data that he, um, from recent trap, traps, um, trapping surveys to um, surveys back in the 1970s. And there was significant declines in both the Eastern Longneck turtles and the Murray River turtles. And in some instances, you're, you're talking of like, um, so you might have juvenile recruitment making up 25% mm, of the population, say, in the 1970s to 0% of the population in 2012. So recruitment has been a major issue and generally thought to be because of two things. Um, Climatic changes and warming, which uh, so that can create issues where turtles can't actually exit the nest. So especially if turtles dig in really clay-based soils, if you don't have very many rain events and that the clay is really hard, sometimes the turtles or the hatchlings can't exit the nest and they're entombed in the nest. That's an issue. And obviously, if you have um, long uh, drought events like the Millennium Drought, you have less water available, more competition, and the body condition of turtles decreases, which means they're less likely to breed, so you're less likely to get recruitment of juveniles anyway because of that. Um, but there is also a reduction in the overall population size as well. And um, James Van Dyke did a great study along the length of the Murray, um, which showed this also particularly disturbingly for South Australia, where they have really very few turtles compared to um, back in the 70s. It's um, especially for the Murray River turtle. Uh, another question about the Murray River turtle is, are they distributed south of the divide and what is their known habitat range? So they are introduced to Melbourne. Um, they occur along the Murray and it's tributaries, but they, um, they don't make it down as far as Melbourne. So the natural range would be from like mid Victoria up along the East Coast. Um, and any that you see down in Melbourne or East Gippsland or um, down the West of Victoria uh, do not naturally occur there. Yep, so that um, there's another question about if we're likely to see them in Melbourne, but it sounds like you might do, but they're not but that's because they've been moved down here rather than it's in their natural habitat range. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Um, you, you can see them in lots of different places in Melbourne. Yeah. But they're not um, naturally occurring there, so to speak. Yep. Great. Uh, will the females still lay eggs if they haven't mated? No. Okay. Uh, will each individual nest 
at the same location each year. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, so this is very common in marine turtles in that the turtles will go back to the same nesting beach. Um, it's quite extraordinary. There, I, we haven't really done very much research in terms of um, for the freshwater turtles but I will say that when I'm doing, when I'm out in the field, they will go to the same areas around a wetland every year, whether or not they're exactly the same turtle, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, and actually, I don't think anyone's looked at that, and certainly not in Victoria. Okay, thanks. Another question just about um, trying to keep rabbits out but letting turtles in just because the, the turtles and rabbits are active at different types at times of the day do you think having a rabbit proof fence that could be lifted up with small openings available only during the day would provide the opportunity for turtles to be able to pass through and get to say like a water source like a dam mm. um, it's a possibility um, I think that so turtles will move around during the day and at night and I certainly see rabbits out during the day but um, I suppose it depends on where where you're talking uh, you could give it a go uh, I don't know that it would it would increase the the probability of a turtle getting through for sure I don't know how how effective it would be though it would have to be tested Yep. And on that note, um, Andrew suggested, do you think creating a water trap under the fence, allowing the turtles to wriggle under, but discouraging rabbits, would something like that work? Yeah, that would be, um, that's certainly something to try for sure. Yeah. If you have the means to do something like that, that's a great way to get around it. Yep. So um, somebody, Adrian, said that there was a Macquarie turtle in Gardner's Creek near Chadston about a month ago. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and uh, Robert's also saying he went with Andrew Hamer to Ruffy Lake in Doncaster a few years ago and they captured a saw, a saw shelled turtle. Yes, that one was very surprising. I do know about that. That was... Um... Yes, that's a Queensland turtle. Um, yeah, I was shocked that that was there. Um, so in the past, we have had some issues, and I'm sure this still continues today, um, where people have, uh, where there have been like large pet trades, um, certainly in the early 1900s and then in the 1930s, you had trades in turtles coming either from the Murray River or from the Gippsland Lakes area. And turtles live a very long time. I'd uh, say that if you're going to have one as a pet, that you want to be particularly dedicated and motivated to have a turtle. Um, they might live for 60 years, so this is a considerable investment. Unfortunately, what we do see is that um, a lot are released into local waterways and dams and wetlands. So hence why we have um, quite a good coverage of turtles throughout the Melbourne area. <laughs> Ruffy Lake is also a spot um, that a freshwater crocodile was found. So it's not a stranger to, to weird reptiles turning up out there. Yeah, right. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can also um, get the odd red-eared slider turtle released in Melbourne. They have quite a few of those in Sydney that's an issue as well. So they're brought in from Asia and they are extremely invasive and can be quite aggressive turtles too. So um, that's also an issue that we sometimes have in Melbourne. Um, question here about um, someone seen an eastern long neck turtle down at the estuary. Is it common for them to frequent estuarine waters? Mm. <clears throat> I wouldn't have uh, thought so. There have been some studies on uh, the effects of salt water on turtles, especially down in South Australia, where they, they had a lot of issues with tube worm infestation when the lakes got super salty. Um, I wouldn't think it would hang there that that much. Maybe it was just a, a look and see, but yeah, I, I wouldn't think that it would certainly stay there for that long. Do eastern long neck turtles translocate easily? In 
in what sense are we talking of translocation? Do we have? Uh, Liz, are you able to put some more details in what you mean by that question? Is that simply just when you're moving them off the road or trying to perhaps put them back in a water source? If you type some more details in, I'll, I'll come back to that question. Uh, just another question about how long do the three species live? It's mm. a great question. It's a bit of a how long, <laughs> how long is a piece of string? So, for example, um, <clears throat> one of the larger broadshell turtles that we've caught, um, I think it was, uh, a, we captured it seven years ago or five years ago, and it had grown three millimetres. This is quite a large adult, um, and it was about five centimetres short of the max size turtle that I've ever captured. gives you a, a certain indication of how long it takes them to grow um, to those really large sizes. So we're talking decades for sure, um, easily over 40 years, quite possibly 60 years, um, some people, as you say, have had them in captivity for 35 years for eastern long neck turtles. So they do reach a considerable age. No one, I think, has um, really tracked it past 35 to 40 years as such, though, as far as I'm aware. Cool. Thank you. Um, lots of thanks to you for great presentation. That's from the, the kids at Morinduck. Uh, does temperature in the nest determine sex of juveniles? Oh, that's a great question. So um, not for these species. It does for a lot of other species and certainly for marine turtles. Um, but these species, it doesn't. Not sex determined, um, not temperature sex determined. Is there a particular time of day that turtles prefer to lay eggs? Broadshell turtles tend to come out during the day. In fact, I think all of them tend to come out during the day, but they will also nest at night time. But mostly um, it'll be after rain events. So depending on when it rains, that's going to be a key time for them to come out and nest. And so could you just clarify, so long neck turtles nest in Kanaka when they're a previous season's nests, um, would that occur when they're still unhatched eggs? Um, sorry, can you say that again? Oh, so long neck turtle nesting can occur when there are previous seasons nests still with unhatched eggs, question mark. Yeah, uh, this is the broadshell turtle. <clears throat> so it's not that common, but they have been known for the, for the hatchlings to be in the nest for up to 600 days. So technically you would have a nesting, another nesting season come around, but the broadshell turtles are very solitary nesters and um, they nest quite far from the water. And it's very unlikely that they would disturb any nests where the hatchlings are still in the nest from the previous season. Okay. And how much of a threat are introduced turtles? Mm. Um, so they're a threat for a, a couple of different reasons, I suppose, in that if you introduce a turtle you don't know what pathogens it might have or diseases that you could introduce that are novel. So um, that is always a risk. Um, and I mean, if you think of things like the Bellinger River turtle, they had a massive population crash recently from, and it, and it wasn't from an introduced turtle, but it shows how susceptible certain populations can be um, to viruses or diseases. Uh, and the other thing is you can also get quite aggressive turtles. So like the red-eared slider turtle, it's quite aggressive. And so you have then a competition effect where it might out-compete local turtles. So um, you, then it'll take most of the resources. It might reduce the health and condition of your local turtles as well. Okay, thank you. Are any of the native species allowed to be pets now? Yes, you can buy turtles um, from obviously registered um, outlets. Uh, obviously you can't take turtles from the wild. Um, and you can have Eastern long neck turtles and Murray River turtles as pets. 
don't think you can have broad shell turtles. Oh no, you might be able to, you just might need to have another level license for that. But um, yeah, you do need to get a license um, for them. So got, um, Liz has typed again, just about a question about translocation. So if found on a road and no close water supply nearby, e.g. could it be released into Devil Bend? Right, yes. No, this is a, yeah, a question that we get quite a bit. Um, what I would say is that what you're most likely going to find is an eastern long neck turtle. And these guys are very terrestrial in that they have a great ability to move across land um, as opposed to the other species. They can move five kilometers across land. So my recommendation would always be to just move them to the side of the road in which they're going because they tend to have some purpose, even, um, even though we're not sure what they're doing. Um, they tend to find their way somehow to water. It's, it's quite a knack that they have. Um, and I'll show you the, although I'd have to stop sharing my screen. I can show you in a second the best way to pick a turtle up if you'd like as well, so that you don't get scratched and, um, and it's the easiest way to handle them. Thank you. There's a couple more questions and then, yeah, that would be great if you could show that. So just somebody asking, do you think it's better to move away from using apps that focus on one species such as TurtleSat, WOMSAT, PlatySat, et cetera, and use apps such as iNaturalist? Mm. Yep, I think there's a role for both. I think um, things like the TurtleSat app and that, they're really great for generating a lot of attention for a species that might need um, particular insights or more intensive mapping, for example. So um, TurtleSat was really great in identifying certain hotspots, for example, for road mortality. And sometimes just using general apps, you can't get enough um, records to um, really to get the data that you need to make to investigate those kind of things. So uh, I suppose that comes down also to advertising and how you reach out to the communities. But I think at the end of the day, all of these records all go to the same place, it, whether it be um, the Living Atlas of Australia. Um, so they all end up in a good location. Uh, there's just different methods for collecting it. But I think both are very worthwhile. Another question about rabbits, uh, keeping rabbits out, but letting turtles in. <laughs> yep. So how about trialing a low electric fence, say approximately 80 millimetres off the ground? Would the carapace inst insulate from an electric shock? Um, oof. I actually do not know the answer to this question. They have done something similar before where they've tried to get um, to the fenced off turtle nesting beaches and then they've had like electric wires which the turtles go under to get to the beach and then that prevents the um, predators getting in. Um, the height that you would have to have it at though, I'm not sure. I would. It's a great question. Um, certainly if you're electrofishing and a turtle is nearby, um, they get zapped but that's through water it's a totally different means of conduction um i would have to do some research sorry that's it for the questions i think i, I don't think i've missed any just lots of thanks hansi's saying a big thank you as well for the work that you do with them they couldn't do it do it without you um there's also a thank you to you as well richard for your work with that and the students have given you eight and a half out of ten. <laughs> you received a solid eight and a half out of ten <laughs> for your presentation. For in presentations, I must say. <laughs> and yeah, just lots of feedback from people saying how much they've um, enjoyed it. Oh, thanks. Yep. Yeah. So thank you, and I'll hand you back over to Richard. Oh, hang on. You were going to do, Katie, you were going to show how to pick up a turtle shell, weren't you? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, best way to do this is if I stop screen sharing or something. Is that right?
Yep. Yeah, yep. And then if you're talking, I think you come up as the main main screen. Okay. So um, I luckily for you guys and unluckily for me because it's quite smelly, I have a turtle shell here and I'll just stand up. So if you have your sh- turtle that's walking across the road, um, it's going to be an eastern long neck turtle. It's going to tuck itself in generally uh, when you come across it. So this is your shell. So this is the top and the bottom. It's quite enormous, so I'm going to have to stand back further. The best way to handle a turtle is simply by having your fingers and your thumb just at the front there. So its neck would be in here. And then again at the back, just like that. So you're just lifting it up straight like this. It can't bite you. It can't really get you with your limbs or scratch you. Uh, Easiest way and then just carry it like that. That's the best way to... um, pick a turtle up and move it off the road. Hopefully you could see that. That was a bit tricky, sorry. And can I ask why you do it kind of at the head and the tail rather than at the sides? So if uh, you can get scratched, essentially, um, turtles, especially uh, Murray River turtles, broadshell turtles, have extremely long claws. I have quite a few scars on my arms and that's just the best way of doing it to minimize um any scratching cool thank you i'll hand back over to you now rich yeah excellent thank you very much uh katie that was a fantastic presentation so it was a really engaging one uh lots of questions that were generated from that one so yeah on behalf of uh everyone um that's joined us today thank you very much for your time and for putting together such a a, a great great um preso no worries. Thanks for having me. And um, <laughs> I just saw a question pop up. Sorry, hilarious. Which way do they squirt the stinky stuff? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. I'll show you quickly if you want. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, funny. Sorry. Okay. So you have the underside of a turtle. So it's limbs, top, it's the front limbs. These are the back limbs. And um, your musk glands will be in here and also in here. So depending on the turtle, it will just leak out or it will projectile squirt out. And there's no way of predicting this. Um, Best way is to just pick it up, like I said, and hold it away from you to avoid it. (laughs) Excellent, that's a fantastic note to finish this on. Uh, excellent. So, yeah, thank you once again. And thank you, everyone, that has come along to join us today. Um, so hopefully my screen is now sharing um, uh, a slide that's showing our next talk that's coming up. So for anyone that is interested, our next Expert Connections webinar will be on the 26th of November. Uh, and so we'll have Josh Griffiths from Enviro DNA and Caesar. Uh, talking about and, and going through the results from some citizen science eDNA monitoring of platypuses around Mumbolt Creek and the Weirby River. So you can check out details on that through the Expert Connections page on the Melbourne Water website. Um, and I think we'll be sending out some information and some links for people to sign up for that as well if you are interested. If you would like to see recordings of this video and other previous uh, videos in this series, you can check out, once again, the Expert Connections page, or you can search for the Melbourne Water YouTube account and uh, check out the videos through there. Um, And yes, once again, thank you very much, uh, Katie. And thank you, Teresa and Elisa, for helping out today as well. Um, And hopefully we'll see you all again in the future. Thank you.